Hello and welcome back to the Biochemistry for Health Sciences channel. In this video, we shall talk about RNA, ribonucleic acid. So where is RNA located in a cell? Uh, most of the RNA is in the cytoplasm, attached to ribosomes as well as attached to the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then there is some RNA in your mitochondria. And the rest is in the nucleus, as well as that region of the nucleus that we call the nucleus. And in the nucleus, we have a lot of ribosomal RNA that is being synthesized. Let's look a little bit at the chemistry of RNA. Uh, ribonucleic acid, since it's ribo, the carbohydrate is ribose and not deoxyribose as what we see in DNA. So in ribose, remember, we have the 2 prime hydroxyl group, which is something not found in DNA. The nucleobases in RNA are G, C, A, and U. Uh, very rare circumstances, you will find a T, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, remember, in DNA, the nucleobases are G, C, A, and T. RNA is single-stranded, unlike DNA, which is double-stranded. But this single strand can fold into a variety of three-dimensional shapes by GCAU pairing. So if there was a G on one segment and a C on the other segment, A on one segment, U another, we could have pairing resulting in folding of the single strand. DNA does not have the two prime hydroxyl group. However, RNA does have the two prime hydroxyl group. And because of this, RNA, the two prime hydroxyl can attack this phosphate and break the phosphodiester linkage. So this is one reason why RNA is much less stable than DNA. So DNA is more stable because it's a permanent storage information for us. RNA is less stable because we don't want it to be around too long. It simply does its functions and then has to be degraded. Although G, C, A and U are the major nucleobases found in RNA, we do also see a lot of chemically modified nucleobases. Here are a few examples. Instead of uracil, the RNA could have dihydrouracil, where this double bond is missing. Instead of uracil, the RNA could have a modified base called pseudouracil that looks like uracil, you can see this is, has moved here, the NH group. And then we have guanine that can be modified by attaching a methyl group here at this nitrogen. And that gives you 7-methylguanine. Besides the nucleobases, the sugar can also be modified, the ribose. For example, this OH, 2 prime, could have a methyl group attached. Okay, that would be called a 2 prime O methylation. So many modifications found in RNA. 
What are the different types of RNA? We could classify RNA into messenger RNA, what we call coding RNA, because this carries the message to make the primary structure of the protein, which then folds into a protein. So that's coding RNA. The rest of the RNA can be called non-coding RNA. So basically we can have coding RNA, which is your messenger RNA, and the rest non-coding RNA. RNA can also be classified into housekeeping RNA. This is your transfer RNA, your ribosomal RNA, and your messenger RNA. And all these three RNA molecules play a very direct and important role in the synthesis of proteins. So these are the housekeeping RNA. The rest of the RNA, the other RNA, we shall call it the regulatory RNA. So these RNAs that include your long intervening non-coding RNA, LNC RNA, and a variety of small non-coding RNA. These various RNA molecules basically regulate, they regulate the protein profile of a cell. What proteins will be found in the cell, how much of that protein will be found in the cell. So they play a very important role in regulation. So we always should keep this big picture in our mind, the flow of information. So we have the genes in the DNA. These genes are transcribed or copied into the various forms of RNA, ribosomal, messenger, transfer, and the regulatory or other RNA. Then this RNA is processed and sent to different parts of the cell. The housekeeping RNA will be directly involved in making the proteins, while the regulatory RNA will regulate this process of gene expression. Now, once the proteins are made, they become the protein profile of these specialized cells. And all of these specialized cells will have their own protein profiles, which will give you the anatomy and physiology of a human being. So while housekeeping RNA is directly involved in synthesis of a protein, what we call translation, the regulatory RNA basically regulates various steps leading to protein synthesis. It can prevent gene jumping. Regulatory RNA can control transcription it can also affect or regulate RNA processing, steps like removal of introns and the chemical modifications of bases or sugars. Regulatory RNA can also lead, can also cause mRNA degradation in the cytoplasm. And this RNA can also inhibit translation as well as affect uh, other parts of protein synthesis, protein folding, processing, as well as transport. So clearly this regulatory RNA has a diverse set of functions. So now that we know what RNA does, uh, the question we always need to go back and try to relate the chemistry to the biology. So why is it that RNA is able to carry out such diverse functions? Um, the reason is because RNA is single-stranded 
and that single strand can fall into a variety of shapes. This will be a very important concept that you have to remember because shapes in biology is what causes specific functions. Okay, so the fact that RNA molecules can form a variety of shapes, you can see all kinds of shapes, is a huge advantage as far as carrying out various functions. And it does so by doing this GCAU pairing. You can see here AU is paired in this single-stranded RNA, GC is paired, while that part where there is no pairing, you can get a sort of a little bubble. Okay, so you can see there are paired segments as well as unpaired segments, giving you a variety of shapes. And then on top of that, RNA has all the necessary chemistry to interact with proteins and via weak forces. So electrostatic, for example, RNA has negative charge and the negative charge can interact with positively charged amino acids in the protein through electrostatic interactions. We could have hydrophobic interactions between the RNA and the protein because as you know, these nucleobases are hydrophobic and they can interact with the hydrophobic amino acids or hydrophobic regions of proteins. And then we have a lot of hydrogens that are attached to electronegative atoms as well as the presence of electronegative atoms. So we can have a lot of hydrogen bonding between the RNA and the protein. So a lot of hydrogen bonding. And then these nuclear bases are aromatic. They have, remember, they are also planar. And then we have nuclear bases in the protein. We have nuclear bases in the protein that are also aromatic. So these nuclear bases in the RNA and the nuclear bases in the protein can stack on one another via stacking interactions. So RNA can bind proteins to form these very interesting structures, what we call ribonucleoproteins or RNP. And these RNPs can carry out the diverse functions that we talked about and that we shall look at in a few seconds. Okay, so let's look at a few important functions of the different types of RNA that we find in our cells. Okay, first let's talk about messenger RNA and small nuclear RNA or SN RNA. So messenger RNA basically is a copy of the gene. So let's say here is a gene and this gene is going to make this protein here, methionine, phenylalanine, proline, valine, lysine. So this gene, you can see there are two strands on the DNA. So only one strand, what we call the template or the antisense strand will be copied. In this case, let's say the antisense strand is copied. The T will become an A in your RNA. The A in your DNA will become U in your messenger RNA. The C will become a G and so on. So the mRNA is transcribed and this is carried out by RNA polymerase 2. RNA polymerase 2. So this gene example here, you can see has two exons separated by an intron. So the messenger RNA that is copied will have the exons as well as the 
introns. In the next step, the messenger RNA undergoes what we call processing. So one of these things that happen in processing is that this intron will be removed and the exon, in this case the C here, will be connected to the other exon, in this case the G here. Okay, so we see this C, G getting connected while the intron is removed. Now this intron removal is done by SNRNA, small nuclear RNA, so here is SNRNA genes present in the DNA. This is transcribed into SNRNA. Various, there are various types of SNRNA, U1, U2, U4, and so on. These SNRNAs then associate with spliceosomal proteins, these proteins here, and form these very large complexes that we call spliceosomes. And these spliceosomes help in removing this intron and connecting the axons together. So besides uh, this process that we just talked about, what we call splicing, there are other kinds of R messenger RNA processing. One is, for example, the addition of a methyl guanosine cap at the five prime end, and a at the three prime end. There is the addition of a poly A tail. The cap offers protection as well as helps in mRNA recognition later on in protein synthesis while the poly A tail protects the three prime end of the mRNA. There are many enzymes that can destroy RNA. Uh, so the two ends especially have to be well protected. Once the processed mRNA is matured, it will then be transported out of nuclear pores. So there are holes in the nuclear membrane and it will be transported out of these by special transport proteins. And the mRNA will reach the cytoplasm where the message will be translated into amino acids. And those amino acids join one another to form the protein. So AUG, for example, according to the genetic code, AUG is a codon for methionine, UUU codes for phenylalanine, CCC codes for proline, GUU codes for valine, AAA codes for lysine, and UAA is what we call a stop signal where protein synthesis stops. So the protein is made, so the message from the DNA is carried to the cytoplasm, and that messenger RNA message is translated into a protein, and the protein then folds and undergoes all, all kinds of processing and then transported to the right location in the cell where it will carry out its function. So this is probably the most important step of, uh, of uh, the information flow that we need to focus on and that is how information goes from DNA and ends up, ends up in a protein. We now look at ribosomal RNA or RNA as well as small nuclear RNA or SNO RNA. So in the nucleolus as well as in the nucleus, we have the rRNA genes and these genes are transcribed by polymerase 1 
as well as RNA polymers 3 to give you various forms of pre-ribosomal RNA, the 47S and the 5S. These pre-RNA molecules then undergo rRNA processing. And this processing is carried out by SNO RNP particles, which is a combination of protein plus SNO RNA. The small nuclear RNA or SNO RNA is made from SNO RNA genes, which is transcribed by polymerase 2. So SNO RNP particles help chemically modify the ribosomal RNA. So examples of these modifications would be pseudouridylation as well as 2 prime O methylation. So these pre-RNA then combine with proteins and undergo further processing where the spaces, the external spaces as well as the internal spaces are removed to form this ribonucleoprotein particles, some with the 28S, 5.8S and 5S, others with the 18S RNA. These particles are then transported out of the nucleus and during protein synthesis, they combine to form the small subunit which is the 40S subunit that contains the 18S RRNA plus about 33 ribosomal proteins, as well as the larger subunit, the 60S subunit, which contains the 28, 5.8 and 5S ribosomal RNA, as well as about 47 ribosomal proteins. Okay, so this gives you the ribosome, which plays a very important role in protein synthesis or translation. Okay, what about transfer RNA? So the transfer RNA genes in the nucleus are transcribed by polymerase 2 or 3, RNA polymerase 3, and these transcripts are then process, a lot of processing happens in tRNA, the leader sequences as well as trailer sequences are removed, there is a lot of splicing and a CCA triplet is added to the transfer RNA. So this here is a basic secondary structure of a transfer RNA, you can see the different loops the D loop that is rich in dihydrouridin, the T loop that is rich in ribotimidin, the anticodon region, and then your CCA ending. This secondary structure further falls into a tertiary structure, which looks like the letter L. This folder structure is then transported out into the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, there is enzymes that we call amino acyl transfer RNA synthetases. They basically recognize the anticodon and they attach the appropriate amino acid to the transfer RNA. 
So such a transfer RNA that has an amino acid attached is called a charged tRNA. Remember this charge has got nothing to do with positive or negative charge, we just call it charged tRNA. So methionine is the amino acid added if the anticodon of the tRNA was UAC, then this enzyme would attach methionine here. If this was another anticodon, then another amino acid would be attached. So these are very, very smart enzymes that can attach the right amino acid to the right transfer RNA. And once the transfer RNA is charged, it can now help in protein synthesis or translation. Okay, a few words about long intervening non-coding RNA or LNC RNA. These are long structures greater than 200 nucleotides. Basically the genes present in DNA are transcribed by polymerase 2 into these transcripts which then undergo processing and folding, including splicing, and many LNC RNAs also contain caps and tails. So once they are folded, they are then carry their functions either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. So this area is very new. We are still trying to understand what LNC RNAs do, but so far we have seen that they carry out a variety of functions. Here are some examples histone modifications right here in the nucleus, methylation of DNA, transcription regulation, actually regulate transcription. They regulate RNA processing. They are the precursors of miRNA and siRNA, which we'll talk about later. And they also regulate the functions of miRNA. They can regulate mRNA degradation so messenger RNA stays in the cytoplasm, but the longer it stays, the more protein is made. So its stability and its uh, half-life in the cytoplasm is important. So it is known that now LNC RNA actually helps regulate the degradation of mRNA. Interestingly, some LNC RNAs actually encode peptides. So small peptides are actually made from LNC RNA. And then LNC RNA, or long intervening non-coding RNA, are also involved in protein synthesis or translation, as well as processing of proteins and transport of proteins to the right location in the cell. One very good example of uh, LNC RNA that we know quite a bit about is the XIST RNA, XIST RNA, which is involved in inactivating one of the X chromosomes in females. Females have two X chromosomes. One of the X must be inactivated. And that's actually carried out by a LNC RNA. Okay, so very diverse set of functions will there's a lot of research going on in this area. We'll surely find out a lot more about these types of molecules in the future. Okay, let's discuss miRNA and siRNA next. So miRNA genes, again, in the DNA are transcribed by polymerase 2, RNA polymerase 2 into pri-miRNA. These pri-miRNA are then processed by proteins such as drosia as well as other proteins into pre-miRNA. The pre-miRNA is then transported out into the cytoplasm where other proteins such as DICER and TRBB2 work on the pre-miRNA and convert it into miRNA. 
this miRNA then associates with other proteins such as argonaut, AGO, and form what we call as the RNA-inducing silencing complex or risk with retained guide. This complex can then go to the mRNA in the cytoplasm that is already made. It can bind to certain segments of the mRNA and cause degradation of the mRNA or can actually inhibit that mRNA from being read, therefore inhibiting protein synthesis or translation. So in this way, miRNA can actually control protein synthesis by affecting the stability of mRNA and or directly inhibiting inhibition. So besides miRNA, we also do have endogenous siRNA. As we mentioned earlier, this could come from LNC RNA or other sources. So this endogenous siRNA, or we could have exogenous siRNA. This may come from viruses or from drugs that we'll talk about uh, at the end of this video. So once you get the siRNA, it goes through the same process as miRNA, combines with RISC, and then can actually uh, degrade the RNA or inhibit protein translation. So there's a little bit about miRNA as well as siRNA and their role in um, degradation of mRNA as well as inhibition of protein synthesis. Okay, so the last type of RNA we're going to talk about is the PV interacting RNA or PIRNA. So PIRNA can be transcribed from uh, various sources. So we have PI clusters. These are genes that are closely associated with transposons. Or tra the transposons themselves can give you the PI RNA precursors, as well as other sources, including uh, genes encoding proteins, can also give you PI RNA precursors, as well as LNC RNA genes. So there are a variety of uh, sources of PI RNA. These are transcribed from these genes into PI RNA precursors, which are then transported out into the cytoplasm where they undergo further processing and then loaded onto PV proteins, which are RNA binding proteins, very similar to the risk complexes that are formed. So these complexes then can undergo amplification and form more PV loaded proteins. Now, once these PV loaded proteins are formed, they can inhibit or stop the actions of these jumping genes or transposons. So how do they do that? How do these PIRNA PV proteins stop the actions, prevent the genes, the jumping genes from jumping on the DNA. And that's very important, especially in germ cells and stem cells, because these genes, as they jump along from one part of DNA to the other part of the DNA, they can lead to mutations that can cause various types of diseases. So it's very important to regulate the activity of these transposons or jumping genes 
especially in germ cells and stem cells. So there are two ways of doing this. One is that these proteins can actually degrade the transposon uh, mRNA and prevent it from being translated into proteins that are necessary for the jumping gene to work. The second is that these things can go right into the nucleus and through methylation, they can silence the gene, prevent the gene from being transcribed. So in this process, in this way, they can silence the transposons, prevent jumping genes. So this is a little bit uh, different than miRNA or siRNA because uh, these piRNA do not depend on dicer uh, and they can act both at the post-transcription level right here as well as at the gene level, gene silencing. So before we end uh, this video, a few words about RNA drugs. Um, one we already know is the COVID-19 RNA vaccine, which is basically your mRNA that is injected. And this mRNA is then translated into the spike protein in muscle cells. And this spike protein then comes out and we make antibodies against the spike protein to help control the COVID infection. Another example of a RNA drug is inclycerin. So it's basically an siRNA, which is taken up by cells. And then just like miRNA and siRNA, it combines with risk. And then it goes and degrades the target mRNA or inhibits this mRNA from being used for protein synthesis. So this particular mRNA codes for protein PCSK9. So by inhibiting this protein, the number of LDL receptors in the liver increase. And more LDL receptors you find in the liver, the more LDL particles will be taken up by the liver and metabolized by the liver. So that will cause a reduction in blood cholesterol. Okay, so by having the liver take up more LDL, the blood cholesterol levels drop. So this is a drug that is used, that is important for people who have high blood cholesterol. So besides statins drugs that we'll talk about later in metabolism, uh, this is another way to reduce blood cholesterol levels. Okay, so that ends the um, video on ribonucleic acid, RNA. Um, hopefully, we will see you in the next video. Have a nice day and goodbye.